Hey everybody, welcome back. Roger Chafian and Boyle Lewis here for the episode five of Masters of the Air Authentic Review. How you doing, Boyle? I'm doing fantastic, Roger. Thanks for having me back again. Absolutely, man. Always a pleasure. So let's jump right into this because, wow, this may have been the hardest episode to watch for me uh, yeah. so far. Yeah, for sure. And it just seems like every episode, the intensity is just getting dialed up and up. Mm -hmm. So let's recap, not the episode itself, but where we are in history for the viewers, because we went from a really long expanded time frame in episode four that covered several months to hitting a, about 30, 36 hours in this episode. That's right. But there's a lot of context to it. So at the end of episode four, we saw that Buck has, has been lost. And this is when Bucky makes the phone call. And that was the October 7th raid on Bremen. And so, yes. you know, briefly, what, what was going on there? So for there, they kept, as we remember, they hit Bremen in one of their first missions as well. Mm -hmm. And it was the idea of, well, we need to help, help win the Battle of the Atlantic. And so we'll take out the submarine pens in Bremen and get rid of the undersea threat. But the defenses there were, were very robust as as well as this incredibly, incredibly thick, high reinforced concrete. Mm -hmm. And the bombs would just kind of bounce off and do very, very little damage to the uh, to the submarine pens. They didn't know that at the really at the time. I think mm -hmm. maybe they had an, an inkling, but that's why they're going after those things again. We talked about Operation Point Blank with how they're going after uh, the German fighters. And they're although they are, they're still part of setting the stage for D-Day, which again, still at this point in history, is set for 1 May 1944, and they know they must have air superiority, must, must, must have it. And the way to do it is to destroy the Luftwaffe, both on the ground and on the air. But Bremen was a particular particular target about, hey, we need to reduce the submarine threat. So right. that's kind of where we are right now. Right, so that was October 7th, and bonus points for listeners, feel free to weigh in in the comments. Uh, there was a secret project later in the war to try and take out the pens that actually took the life of JFK's older brother. So, yeah, we won't say anything about that. Weigh it in the comments if you know, guys. Yeah. Uh, so that was the 7th. October 8th is a raid on Marienburg in Germany. That's not depicted, uh, but it's implied because we're getting three raids back to back to back here. And I don't know that there's much to talk about um, about the Marienburg raid itself, other than once again, planes are going up, crews are being lost. There's no downtime between missions. That's Any, exactly anything, right. Boyle? You think that we need to talk about about uh, Marienburg itself? I don't think so, but we see kind of the effects that the group is having when we get into the episode with the repairing of aircraft, new airframes. You know what? What bomber are we in today? Mm -hmm. the maintenance crews working very, very hard. And so we're seeing not only effect on the, the men as they're losing men, but also the effect on the material as they can only put up 17 bombers. They can only get 17 in the air out of a group of that's supposed to have 36 aircraft. Right. So, you know, 50% would uh, mission availability rate in wartime where the rules are, are slid just a little bit to get, right. to get planes on the deck, so to speak, on the roof to get uh, boats in the water, man, 50% is, you're in a bad way. You're, you're in a bad, in a bad way. way, yes. Yeah, so we get to October 10th, which is the raid depicted in this episode, episode five, the raid on Munster. And we'll talk about that in the episode recap, but suffice it to say, the idea that you're gonna fly a raid, you're gonna get a couple days off to recuperate, to let your ground crews fix the planes, it's not happening. And the strain is really, really starting to tell now. That's right. So we essentially start after a little little intro with uh, with Clevin in the cockpit, right? And just sort of set his mood with Crosby's crew returns. And I thought this, it wasn't explained really, really well in the episode, in my opinion, but it started to give that flavor of planes don't come home and you assume the guys haven't made it. But lo and behold, they, they did. did right? they made it. Yeah. 
So they they got home, but they crashed uh, crash landed at an RAF base, if memory serves, and were able to get back to the base only to get the welcome of, hey, your bunks have been, give, been given to other guys, right? That's right. And that was the standard procedure at the time. If an aircraft didn't make it back and they hadn't heard from them, then they would, you know, they would see them all land. And then, as we know now, they immediately go off to interrogate into it interrogation for their intelligence debriefing and there would be ground crew who would then go into the the uh the barracks where the men were and then they would pack up whoever was lost or didn't make it back they'd pack up all their gear and have it gone so by the time you got out of interrogation you went back to your room Mm -hmm. half the half the quonset might be empty depending on how well or poorly the mission went and so they fell victim to that because in the previous mission they were lost assumed nobody saw them nobody knew what happened and so all their stuff gets packed up and get gets ready to get shipped back home right so not really an auspicious you know homecoming and then start to the prep for this next mission and then crosby gets the sort of bittersweet news that might not even be the right word that he has been posted to be the wing navigator that's right and so what does that mean Boyle, to for a a crew navigator to now be the wing navigator. How does that change his life? Yeah, so the wing navigator, we got a little taste of it. He kind of goes into the operations center and there's maps and people doing mission planning. You see the intelligence officer, the major, they're pouring over the maps and, you know, where's it going to be the best place to hit the target? And Crosby, his job is to plan the route. What route are they going to fly in based off of the threats? And where do they know where flak batteries are? And where are known... Luftwaffe bases, and where is the initial point going to be, i.e., when do they make their attack run, and then how are they going to egress out of that target? And so he has to set up all of those things, getting them from the airfield, and then the other groups from the airfield, getting them together, or planning those routes, getting them together. It's a hugely important job, as we've seen from the kind of rudimentary navigation that they're using compared to today. You know, they've got map, compass, and stopwatch. Right. Take- taking into account the weather. So it is a hugely important job. Um, and he's feeling the, the weight of the responsibility of that, I think, because he doesn't feel like he's worthy, although we've seen his skills improve dramat- dramatically. He was the group navig- made the group navigator, so he's the one leading the entire group through his navigation. And he feels a little unworthy of that. And you know, the, the bitterness with it is he is not going to be there with everybody else when they go on the mission. He is going to be stuck on the ground. You know, that is his job now. Right. Uh, and that, you know, you've you've worked the point into things and you've worked as a staff officer. Yeah. So, you know, well, you know, the sense of responsibility when you're planning for somebody else to go in harm's way is enormous. Right. Because you. Any mistake that happens, you are going to think is yours, whether that's it is exactly, or not. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And and that happens, you know, especially during um, carrier operations while, you know, crews are asleep or maybe you have an alert um, waiting in the ready room. And all of a sudden you get tasking that comes down. Hey, the very first launches of the day are going to be going to here, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And this would happen quite often. Hey, here, here's going to be the targets. Here's what's going to happen. And so if you were awake on the alert you would do all the mission planning for them because you mm-hmm. can't wake them up. They've got to, you know, they got to sleep right. and get their, get some rest. And so when they would roll in, you would go, here you go. Here's all the mission planning done. Here's the weather. Here are the targets. They'd be very thankful, but boy, you were really triple checking your homework mm-hmm. almost more so than when you're doing it. Oh yeah. Self. And you felt a little bit like, man, I wish I was going with them because we did this planning. It's very exciting. And you want them to do their best, but now you're just stuck back there on the ship. Right. Or in Crosby's, Crosby's case, on the ground as you watch them launch off, hoping you did you did the best work possible. Right. And now, do you recall from the book, was he made the group navigator just before this raid, before the Munster raid on October 10th? He was, and I don't recall in the book if it was because you know, he sustained some injuries. I think a little bit more than what was depicted mm-hmm. uh, on the show. So I don't know if that had a part to play, but he was truly the best navigator that right. they had. And w- with their amount of attrition, certainly the most experienced. Right. Uh, even compared to uh, Bubbles, 
you know, he yeah. had better skills than Bubbles. Mm-hmm. And when you're going to plan for the entire wing, you really need your top person. Right. Doing that. You, you put your best in the most important position. That's but right. I can only imagine without jumping too far ahead. And, you know, hopefully if you're listening to this, you've watched the episode first. That's the way we, we uh, that's, that's intend we these roll. to be yeah. done. What a mission to have your first as a planner and, and the sense of, you know, could I have done anything differently? That's right. But I think we'll get to that with the closing scene yep. of the episode. So we're at this point of flying every day. We mentioned that, the attrition that's going on with the crews, with the aircraft. You mentioned only 17 flying fortresses, some from other outfits. Um, you know, Robert Rosenthal, who will go on in, in his bird, uh, Rosie's Riveters, is now in Royal Flush. That's right. And that, that sort of brings up the issue of how did this work? With this maintenance so we i like the fact that we're seeing the ground maintenance crews from the squadrons and from the from the group there but the way it worked at the time was if a plane was too badly damaged they would send it back to a depot in england and that depot would decide should we fix it or is it just too badly damaged and we're going to strip it and cannibalize it that's right they sure would yeah and they worked uh, they work miracles. We'll put a picture up here. There was probably the most famous example was a was a B seventeen called Little Miss Mischief, which was half bare metal and half olive drab because they put two different planes together. That's exactly. Uh, and yes. yeah, we'll we'll see later in the series they stopped painting the B seventeens because uh, of the weight savings and there was no point to the camouflage anymore. But these guys really worked miracles at the depots and they're generally unsung heroes but without those guys and their counterparts on the ground getting sherman tanks back into action once the invasion happened none of this happens there are not enough b-17s coming from even the united states industrial production there just aren't enough to keep up unless they can scrap these back together that's exactly right and i and i i will say you know, that is still a constant theme in, in aviation today. You know, there's not a service out. It doesn't matter where you're, who you're flying with, the Navy, the Air Force, the Army, the Marine Corps, or I would say it transcends nationality. Mm-hmm. You love your maintainers. They're the only right. reason that you're able to put iron in the air. The only reason. That's it. Right. So we get we get past the mission planning, and we see the dichotomy of, of uh, Crosby working through the night, getting the target package together, and then the crews come in for the briefing, and it's the marshalling yards in Munster, and they mention that it's next to a cathedral, a fairly major cathedral in Germany, and it's on a Sunday, and this this causes a lot of consternation, and it's shown in the episode, but you know, tell us, Boyle, from uh, the book, which is even more definitive, this, this was not just a smooth it over kind of thing. There was some serious heartburn among the crews. There was, and I wish they'd kind of depicted a bit more, or maybe it would have been unbelievable to the audience, but, you know, according to the book and through, you know, through research and eyewitness testimony that, that Miller did was, I mean, people jumped up and were shouting during the briefing that yeah. we shouldn't do this. What are we doing? How dare we? do this kind of target and they eventually get kind of you know uh tampered yeah. down by the uh, by the group commander by the colonel but i mean it, it caused a visceral reaction amongst the group and these are guys who are probably pretty worn down and pretty jaded and yet still it went against their idea of of what they of what they thought they were doing right and you know even even in total war which i think we can say world war ii was you know, there's that feeling of collateral damage. And we didn't really look at it that way. And we knew we were inaccurate with the bombs. And they're even mentioning it. But just knowing that you're going to bomb something and it's, yeah, it's this close. And those are rail workers. And this to have such an upsurge of open and vocal dissent really speaks volumes, I think. Like, the, these guys weren't there because they wanted to do this. That's exactly right, you know, and they're still, although they know it's not working, and we've talked about this before, this daylight, this idea of daylight precision <laughs> bombing, 
isn't working as planned, they're still executing like they think it's still working. So it's a weird dichotomy. And maybe that's how they're trying to convince themselves. But this is, they know that civilians are going to die mm. on this one. Right. I mean, they know that. A, a very worthy target. Certainly, mm-hmm. military necessity is there, but you know they know just how how poor their aim is, even on the best day, and and this is going to go badly. Right, and we see a little bit of a confrontation with Buck, who is does not have any such hesitation. That's right. Yeah, clearly somewhat emotional about uh, Bucky still, but. I thought it was interesting because now just in a matter of months, we see U.S. Army Air Force crews starting to shift. And we remember the Royal Air Force crews in in the first episode who were very jaded. Uh, And now we see this effect of this is starting to happen. And even in a country where, you know, let's keep in mind, it's we're closing in on 100 years ago where going to church was was much more common was a much bigger deal most of these these guys grew up going to church the idea of knowingly dropping bombs on a church on a sunday it's just just they were they were stuck they were yeah. really stuck and it's a tough position which i think speaks even more to the professionalism and the dedication to duty that these guys had because you couldn't just wash your hands of it and turn around, right? Because if you think of the alternative, both personally and then for the world, it's it's untenable. That's exactly right. And for them, you know, that, that was an interesting exchange to show the difference between the two, uh, two opinions between Bucky and the other, and his, uh, mm-hmm. uh, who's the pilot of the, right. uh, of the aircraft. But, you know, my, my own personal theory of war is, you know, the longer the war goes on, the more the violence is right. going to dial up. You don't get yep. the firebombing of Dresden on day one. Right. So that exactly. Later. And the RAF crews, they've been at this now. You know, this is fall of 43. Golly, they've been at this since 1939, September of right. 1939. So over four years that they've been doing this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, why won't the Germans quit? They're bombing us. We saw in the last episode kids being dragged out of rubble. And so, again, the, the thin, thin veneer of, of civilization is, is wearing right. away now. Is wearing away. And I will say a little bit with, I have a little bit of parochial bias, maybe pro-Navy Marine Corps, which doesn't necessarily make me anti-Air Force, but there was this commitment to precision bombing, even then, and strategic bombing, and this will win the war. And it was interesting to see the crews acknowledging we're not that precise. This isn't happening. That's right. Both our crews and the British knew it didn't break the spirit of the Brits. And in fact, it didn't break the spirit of the Germans. But we're still saying we're going to go in there and we're going to do this. And, you know, so there's a little bit of just bloody minded adherence to doctrine but yeah i don't want to be a revisionist historian and and ascribe ill motives to these guys i think at the time people thought this is going to work we don't have another option and we're only 20 years removed if that from the bloody trench warfare of world war one which made such an impression on the psyche of, of the men who were planning this war yeah, and then, it, you know, we started off a couple episodes with the colonel pulling out the ball bearing. Hey, we're going to take out the ball bearing factory and then all their machine, you know, it's machine versus machine. Right. And now for this one, as he kind of quiets everybody down, he's like, hey, look, we're going to hit these marshalling yards. And if our bombs miss, oh, it's going to hit the houses around there where all these train workers live. And e- either way, we're, we're having an effect. And so now right. it it is creeped in instead of machine versus machine. Now it is, okay, if we hit the workers now, and it's this kind of, um, you're normalizing what you're going after. Right, and it it goes way beyond the scope of of this episode or even this show, but there was a, there was a method to why they were hitting the rail yards at this point, right? They were paralyzing the rail transport network of the Third Reich. 
They were, and that'll come, not spoiler alert, for yep. later episodes, I think we'll see more of that later. Okay. But this was kind of a one-off for the 8th Air Force. Mm -hmm. uh, the 8th Air, 8th Air Force was, uh, was kind of forced into this particular one. And then we'll talk about the results at the, at yeah. the end of the episode, I'm sure. Um, but going at 8th Air Force, in their mind, they did not want to hit this kind of target mm -hmm. right now. They wanted to hit fighter industry, submarine pens, war making right. kinds of things they didn't have this in their calculus quite yet right valid point because there is some friction as as what uh, autumn turns to fall turns to spring before d-day yes of what are we going to hit and yeah we'll see I, I we'll see what they yeah. put in the uh in the series so before we get to take off in the mission the crews are in the trucks they're heading out and uh you know, we've got Bucky jumps out and goes, I'll catch up with you. I'll take a Jeep. And he switches out jackets. Yeah. What's that all about? This was really interesting. I thought it was one of two things. One, he is, re you know, Buck is heavily on his mind and everything that Buck thought about. And he switches out his jacket and he explains it when he gets in the bomber. He's like, yeah, Buck always hated that jacket. And he probably wore it to kind of needle his friend, like we do. You yeah. know, you do the thing that yeah. kind of needles your friend. You're kind of oh, absolutely. It. And it's all in good fun, especially if you're in a squadron, squadron together or in combat together. You're going to do those kinds of things. Yeah. But now so. he knows. I think it was to honor his friend's memory. He has no idea what happened to. Him. In his mind, he's he's probably he's dead. You know, that's what mm -hmm. he's thinking. Nobody saw any shoots. They just saw the bomber go down. It is a complete unknown. And I think to honor right. his, he's like. I'm flying this flight out of revenge. You know, right. let's be honest, that's his motivation right now. And I'm going to lead these men and we're really going to take it, take it to uh, the third Reich, but I'm going to honor my friend because he hated that jacket. And so I'm going to put on a different one. Right. I'm going to put on the kind that he, he flew with, you know, pilots, I think military guys in general are superstitious, right? Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, you know, changing something like that is, you know, Big we'll see. Deal. Yeah, we'll see. So, Everyone, you know, they, they come and they go out to the birds and they're like, well, which bird or win as we talked about? And they've got the different birds and they, they do manage to take off and form up. And again, not a lot of mention of how difficult it is to form up in the fog. Maybe at the end of this, we'll, if they miss things that we would have liked to have seen, you and I can put together a okay. list of things we would have liked to see. So I won't get on to formation lead ships and, and stuff <laughs> like that right now. But they do manage to take off and they get across the channel and they mention, well, here's our fighter escort, but you know, they don't have enough range. At least they got us across the channel. Yeah. Now I'll, I'll defer to your knowledge on this one. Uh, I think that was just a really easy point for people to understand that they got them across the channel. I think, I think by that point they were even going a little bit further. They were going a little uh, bit over further. France and, and Holland. You, maybe they had developed drop tanks for the P 47s at this point mm -hmm. and they could just make it to Germany, you know, right. it depended on the weather. When did they take off? How long did they have to loiter to wait to, to, to form up on everybody? But what I would like folks who are, who are listening to us or, and watching us to remember the kind of tactic that is used right now. We see the P-47s kind of in and about the, the bombers and they're flying in and out doing this close escort. And so just remember the close escort that they're using right now, because that'll change right. later. Right. That'll change. I'm going to correct myself there. I said Holland, I should say the Netherlands. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, just, just to be very precise. So they take off and uh, we already see the effect of the Warren aircraft. And it's not just in, um, you know, getting these things back together. They're not tip top at all. No. Right. The, the engines are worn. The planes are worn and we see the hundredth having trouble maintaining their position in the formation. So uh, I don't remember if it was Flight of the Intruder. It was one of the aviation books I read back, you know, when I was a teenager that I remember very distinctly the flight lead sort of coming up to speed. And then one of the wingmen's like, hey, I need you to back off just a hair. So he pulled his throttle back and like set the the friction knob so he would only go as yeah. fast as the rest of his formation a as a pilot you know talk us through that right because there's of course you could go look at a book and see how fast a b-17 goes 
Um, and that's like looking in Jane's and then saying how fast my destroyer went. And all I can tell you is that destroyer class went that fast once. Yeah. And, and someone wrote it down and said, that's what it is. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure it's the same for planes, right? That's right. When they're like, top speed is this. You're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Downhill on a good day. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Drop from space. Pointed straight right. down. Yeah. Full afterburn. So, yeah. so as a flight lead, what is that like? You know, you have to sort of balance all these things. You do. And they've got, you know, some real big decisions to make because if they slowed down, you know, when we saw the, I think in episode two where they slowed down uh, for one of the aircraft, but that was just their group and they were able to do that. Now they're amongst a wing and in order to maintain that kind of integ that formation integrity, the wall of steel that they're able to put up with their tight formation, if they can keep, can't keep up, they they are now making themselves a target for the Luthwaf coming up because now that's the that's the group you're going to go after, and if they start slowing down, that's going to get spaced out even more, and the the bombing isn't going to be as accurate and as and as precise or give it the the punch and the weight that it really needs, and it's just all bad. And so now you have a choice right. as the the group lead with Bucky up in the front. As somebody falls out, you're like, hey man, they just they have to go. You're putting everybody in the entire mission at risk. And that's probably something that that they knew ahead of time. That if, if it happens here, sorry, you know, especially once the fighter escort drops off, sorry, you're you're gonna yeah. be on your own, unfortunately. You're on your own. Mm -hmm. So with that, we drop off the fighter escort. The hundredth is starting to break out of formation a little bit. And the Germans wanted this, right? The the Germans oh, yeah. wanted isolated squadrons isolated groups and they actually had some weapons and tactics that they hoped would accelerate that or expedite that so with that let's go ahead and take a look at a clip Yeah, um, intense. So these rockets, and we'll put some pictures up here to show everyone what's going on, but that's not um, not rockets as we would think about them today, right? What what were these weapons? So these were rockets. The idea from the German Luftwaffe was, well, we've developed this head-on tactic because that's where it's the most vulnerable and it's where you can take down a, uh, they called them the Boeings. They didn't call them the B-17s. So you can take down the Boeings more easily that way. Um, and then they thought, well, we'll have these rocket, you know, these huge giant flying missiles packed full of explosive that can, you know, has this monster of a frag pattern on it as well. And if you can shoot up, especially into a tight formation, you don't even need to hit one of them. You just need this thing to go off somewhere in the middle and you are going to have an effect. Clearly, if you hit a bomber head on, it's going to take, take the whole thing down, but you're going to have a dramatic effect on it. Um, if you're able to shoot a rocket in this formation. So they adapt the, uh, the Falkwolfs, the, uh, uh, the BE-109s. They have some twin engine ones as well. The, the JU-88s uh, were adapted with, with these as well, as well as the, I think, the BE-110s. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and, you know, we'll see if they get into this in a later episode. And if not, we can put it into our things we missed, the... the uh... The Sturmstaffels and the, you know, they, right. the Germans <laughs> ended up creating, okay, we've got squadrons that go after bombers and we've got squadrons that go after their yeah. escort fighters. And we'll talk more about that, those details later. But yeah, these rockets were almost like enormous, similar to the rockets that you'd see the Germans using from uh, uh, rocket launchers on the ground on their half tracks and, and towed. And as Boyle said, the idea was not necessarily to hit a bomber. That was a bonus but to blow up in the middle of a formation and scatter the formation so that the fighters could come after individual bombers, as we saw, very effective, very effective. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I thought that was unusual that their tactic, what either do it head on mm -hmm. so you could time it a little bit better about like, I'm going to get this thing into the middle of the formation or tail on. And that right. way you stay out of the arc of the machine guns. 
Mm-hmm. I think you kind of peel away after that. Uh, right. But again, minor critique. On, minor, yeah. On so, uh, so, yeah. So we've got the Rockets hitting the formation. They're getting engaged. And then uh, Bucky's plane. He's, he's the mission commander, so not his plane, but he's the mission commander. And they start losing engines. Right. Let's let's do another brief clip here, then have a discussion about that. Turn the clock on. Tail, we lost another one. Last of the low element. Number three's on fire. Shutting off gas and feathering. We're fine. We're maintaining speed. Yeah, just. We can make it to the target. Yeah. So <laughs> one engine's down. We're about to see more go down, and they, they eventually end up on one. How it, realistic was that? It uh, The B-17 could fly on one. You had to be airborne first, right? You couldn't take off right. one engine. And there are instances of B-17s getting damaged in three of the four engines and limping back to England on, on one motor. So not unrealistic that they could keep going along but it would have to be as we saw in uh, episode three where they did the shuttle run we're gonna have to chuck weight out Mm -hmm. uh, in order to uh improve the thrust on that that remaining motor but it was conceivable that you could make it back and what they're talking about there you know we're still maintaining speed the speed they need to stay even in their terrible position that they are and are still slowly getting you know, even more out of position as time is going on. Right. And worth mentioning, um, the, you know, you could push engines beyond their rated limit in an aircraft. That's right. Of, of the day. So, you know, you're burning out the engine, but I think they also knew we're, we're not even going to nurse this thing home. Like they're, by the time they're down to two, he's pretty much like, keep us in formation. By the time he's down to one, he's like, no, I want to, and they just can't do it. And that brings up a nuance that I really liked that, again, I didn't think they brought out really, really well for people who didn't know, was this is why that lead navigator was so important, is that once Bucky fell out of formation and another aircraft came up to take the lead, there's the scene where the uh, trail aircraft is is like, hey, are we on the target? Yeah, we're on the target, but Lead hasn't dropped his bombs. That's right. And what? So why was that? So that was that was a um, a technique that um, Lemay had come up with. Instead of all of the bombardiers dropping off their own calculations, you would take the best the best bombardier, the person who was the best at it or shown the best skill, and you would put them in the lead aircraft. So in this case, Bucky's. And then there would be a degradation of them, but it was based off of skill level going down. And you would have them drop, and everybody else just kind of watching the lead aircraft. And as soon as they dropped their bombs, then everybody would drop at the same time as well. Right. So if you can imagine, so not the entire rate, of course, but in your oh. squadron, you're probably going to drop. But that just speaks to the, as you said, precision or lack thereof right because the guy a couple dozen hundred yards in front of me is dropping right now an unguided bomb from 25 or thirty thousand feet well he's dropping so i'm gonna drop yeah right i mean right there you're gonna get dispersion all over the place but that's how it really happened and that's right you know i i like the fact that they brought that up but in any event bucky's plane cannot stay in the formation they they start to fall out and they make the decision we got to go yep right so let's look at that first first i want to show the clip cuz once again we're going to mention the reverence with which the norden bomb site yes was was held and so we'll pull that up here Police formation oh. ah! Time for the fucking bombs now! Hit the bell up though! Ah. 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 Destroy the bomb site! Shoot it! Ah. A little 
amusing i don't know is that is that the right word is that i i feel like there should be a little less uh levity when i say that but you know this plane is going to crash to the ground from from twenty five thousand feet but we better put a bullet through the bomb site that's right and it's that reverence that they had for that you know highly classified piece of technology that they had at that they had back then. And we've seen that, you know, episode, almost every mm-hmm. single episode, I think there's been some mention of right. Norton bombsite and just how important it was. And it truly was a, a, mm-hmm. a revolutionary piece of uh, piece of kit in spite, you know, for all of our bagging on, you know, precision and we can look back now, right. that was the best in the world. Nobody right. had a piece of, of bombing equipment like that. And they certainly didn't want it to fall into German hands. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and why shoot it? Well, there's internal mechanisms, there's right. internal workings, gyroscopes, if I remember correctly. Right. And, you know, that was one of the interesting things in looking at the technology of the Second World War. You know, Americans, America, I should say, we really understood gyroscopes and how to use them. So even our tank gun sites had gyroscopes. So, you know, the Sherman tank could shoot on the move. Yeah. Whereas most German tanks had to stop to shoot. That's a huge disadvantage. Yeah. So, even though you may think, well, what difference does it make? That's how Intel works, right? A little piece here, a little piece there. And the Germans were excellent at taking crashed aircraft and reverse engineering them and figuring out what made that design work. So seems a little odd to us, but this is the reverence with which that, that was held. And yeah. I think I've said it maybe in another episode of this series or somewhere else, you know, I do have that weird memory of abandoned ship drills where if you work in combat systems while everyone else is heading topside you're grabbing sledgehammers and smashing computer drives and wiping uh magnets over hard drives to make sure that if somehow the ship is salvaged by the enemy they get as little as possible that's exactly right Mm -hmm. right so the plane's going down we see the debate between bucky and brady who's the aircraft commander and Who's going to go? Who's going to jump? I think this really showed the, okay, I'm going to hold the plane for the crew to jump, which was, you know, very common. I would say it was probably the default value. Uh, But then we get into a little bit of a conundrum, and and I'll let you tell the story after the clip because I think they hit it pretty faithfully. I think they did too. There they go! They're all Get off this dump! Go! You go! God damn it, Brady! I'm the senior officer now! Jump! It's my ship! You jump! What are your thoughts? I mean, I know you flew single seat, so not the same, right? And right. in an ejection in an ejection seat equipped aircraft, you don't even have a choice, really, no, right? Like they're right. sequenced. Uh, there's no way that Goose goes after Maverick, if, even if he wants to. Right. That's exactly right. But I think it like, shows the the you know the military responsibility and mm-hmm. you know the weight of that. Where there they are, staying in the bomb bay. This plane is going down. Yeah. And they're arguing about <laughs> who's the most seat, you know, so bizarre. Yeah. But yeah. like that, that really happened. You know, this really, right. really happened. They really argued about Bucky's point is like, I'm this, I'm the mission commander. I'll be mm-hmm. the last one to go. And the other guy, Barnes, like, no, I'm the, I'm the aircraft commander. I will be yeah. the last to leave here. <laughs> and what actually settled the discussion? You can tell if you know what settled that argument. 
from That's that right. clip. But if you don't know, I don't know if it came across. Yeah, it's settled by them getting strafed and holes being punched in the aircraft, which is what really <laughs> yeah. happened. And then Bucky was like, all right, see ya. <laughs> yeah, all right. Let's see. You know, incoming fire is a great motivator, isn't it? Is. it? Yeah, right? it'll so, uh, yeah, spur <laughs> innovation. Yeah. Make you make a decision. So, uh, you know, coming off that levity a little bit about incoming fire, one thing um, I saw in this episode a little bit more was the injuries to the crew members. Yes. And the attempts to treat and give first aid, which was very real. And I mentioned before we had a listener comment after the first episode that said, you know, they haven't shown yet this flight home, right? So you've made it out through three or four hours inbound. Now you're wounded, you're freezing, you don't know if you're gonna die. Uh, I think we're getting closer to that. Right, we but, are. but we're probably still not, we haven't seen it yet. We haven't seen the real nail biting, That and that sounds like such a cliche, but the fear you have of how long till my buddy gets definitive medical treatment. That's exactly right. But we did see, you know, several times during this episode, that choice you now have, do I man my gun or do I help out my buddy, my buddy. fighting with yeah. mission after mission after mission, and now they're wounded or killed and you know, I, I have a choice to make here. We are under attack. You know, where do I go? Right. And it's because we, we know the doctrine answer, right? The yeah, doctrine right. answer is stay in the fight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's a lot easier said than done though. Yes. Yeah. So we now sort of come to focus on uh, Major Rosenthal, Rosie, mm -hmm. and he's in Royal Flush again, a borrowed aircraft. And they're they're flying, and they cut to a scene that felt to me a little. At first, at first, I I, I was worried it was going to be very Hollywood cliche, but I thought they did it really well, and that's the debris field scene. Yeah, let's let's cut to that now, and then we'll we'll talk about it after, and and discuss what we see here. Okay. appreciated that scene. I don't want to say liked it, but I really appreciated that scene. And I, I'll come at this uh, from a historical perspective and then a film perspective, but Boyle, did, did things like that happen? Was that, you know? I'm sure it seemed, you know, whether it looked exactly like that, who knows? You know, we, we weren't there and they didn't really have cameras, you know, recording right. everything, but I'm sure that's what it felt like, you know, and I thought it gave a good depiction of this is a battlefield. This right. is not a clean environment. It is not, um, it is harsh. It is misunderstood. It, it, they are making things up as they go along. The, the tactics aren't working and it is a battlefield and it is brutal. And what it's showing to me as well, I think we'll talk about at the end, but you know, this is attrition warfare. And when we see all that attrition and mass being put up, it's going to be ugly and, and, and violent. Right. And the, um, the, the, I have read accounts that said, you know, and there was debris falling all over the place, not from the hundredth, not from this. So I, I feel like that was probably accurate in terms of conveying the message to the audience. I don't know if it, like you said, would it actually have looked that way? So I thought it was, I thought it was good historically to show, you know, you're in these tight formations and what happens when something explodes next to you, right? Like, uh, I, I'm sure you've had things explode near you. Uh, I've had things explode near me. It, you know, Hollywood likes to show the big blast wave and everyone doing the, uh, you know, the, and the reality is the blast, you know, unless you're really that close, the blast isn't knocking you down, but you're like, oh, you know, bleep my word out here, there's crap falling all over around right. you, right? If something's exploded. So I think 
that was really good to show that. I appreciated them slowing down this scene because at least for me, it one gave the viewer a chance to process better if they don't know everything that's going on. Cause it's happening normally in the scenes in the flash of an eye, mm -hmm. which is real, right? Uh, you know, uh, you you have closed with targets far faster than I have because in my instance only one of them was an aircraft, <laughs> uh, but I know my experience the craziest of which the craziest pilots I have ever seen and I say that as uh, a token of respect were Croatian <laughs> MiG twenty one pilots of all people we were doing an exercise and they would I, they're not fjords and I know they're not fjords but I just use that term because they have that sort of crenellated coastline there. These guys would come over the ridge line in their in their green and brown MiG twenty ones. You would not see them. You might get a little heat blur over the ridge. You might get a little bit of smoke. And the next thing you knew, they were a blur crossing in front of our bridge below the level of our bridge. Right. And I'm <laughs> I'm flashing back to the videos I'd seen of the Falklands War and the Argentinians, uh, you know, with their Skyhawks coming yeah. over the British fleet. And what I liked about this scene was that that it happened in the blink of an eye. When, and, you know, I've had other aircraft come and buzz us and stuff like that. And it it happens in the blink of an eye, but then somehow in your mind's eye, sometimes time will slow down. Mm -hmm. Not not quite to that extent, but you see everything really clearly. Was did you get did you have that experience? Absolutely. You know, things happen so, so fast. And it's only upon reflection that you, you kind of remember those details. And, you, and, and you're surprised that, like, holy cow, I can't believe I I remember that. Right. And I, th I think we'll see that in a clip that's coming up in a moment. They do it one more time. Uh, but we'll talk about that here momentarily because now um, they've completed the bomb run. They're off. Rosie, who's, this is his third, third mission. Do I have that right? This is his yes. third mission and he's calling all the crew and there's no one left. Yeah. It's, they're, it's just they're them. It. Right. They're it. You're the only ones left. And this is exactly who the Luftwaffe wants. That's A right. bomber alone, no protection. So let's take a quick look at that. And I have. Some questions about it, as I'm sure a, a lot of viewers do. Any of the ships from the hundred? Top turret to pilot, negative. Left waist gunner to pilot, negative. All turret to pilot, negative. Nose negative. Tail to pilot, negative. Right waist gunner, negative. Bogies, five o'clock high. Warn those assholes at seven o'clock high. Pilot to crew, hold on everybody. Oh, 
Okay, hang on. I'm gonna put these two on your back doorstep. That was well, great. <laughs> <laughs> great scene. I I love the the sort of slow transition as the Messerschmitt comes by. Uh, I didn't go pull out any books or references, but uh, it my it, as far as my recollection goes, pretty good uh, attention to detail on the markings. I think it was JG twenty six, so they they've got some some attention to detail and accuracy there. Yep. Uh, and again, that sort of time dilation that happens. But let's talk about what what uh, Royal Flush is doing there, because if you've listened to any podcasts on any sort of fighter combat, you know what what basic fighter maneuvers are. Well, me, the the SWO expeditionary guy, is pretty sure there's no such thing as basic bomber maneuvers. That's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> what what were we seeing there, in your opinion, Boyle? So we were seeing there. Just to back up, if we remember, we were first introduced to Rosie in the previous episode. Mm -hmm. uh, both Buck and Bucky make a comment because they've heard what a great right. pilot he is. And mm -hmm. uh, Buck and takes Rosie up a few times. They're doing kind of training missions around England. Kind of like, hey, let me, show me what you got. And kind of puts him through the ringer and is really, really impressed with his flying skills. So Ro Rosie is a, very, is a highly, highly skilled B-17 pilot, really knows how to handle that airplane. And Rosie knows that it is much harder to hit a moving target. Mm -hmm. So let's not just sit here being a sitting duck. Let's maneuver around the sky. And he is right. no doubt pushing that thing to its absolute limit. Uh, right. But I love the crew coordination that they have. People are calling out. It's very professional. You know, this is a crew that, although new, right, this is their third mission, they are highly, highly skilled, and they, and they have one of the best pilots in all the Eighth Air Force at the controls. Right, and and we'll see that as the series continues, yeah. we'll see more Rosie. So, uh, not being a pilot, I I think the degree of aerobatics may have been uh, exaggerated a bit. Or I mean, I I didn't they say didn't they claim in that earlier episode he actually looped a B seventeen. I don't remember that part. I don't remember if they said he, that, but parts there he he's he's maneuvering the throttles differently to get right. some more uh, some uh, better yaw, some yaw. Or, or yeah better turn rate with uh, with uh, adverse yaw. Um, right. So I really like that aspect of it. And then honestly, th you think about in the book in, in Don Miller's book, he talked Rosie talks about yeah I did some aggressive maneuvering and then they kind of left us mm -hmm. alone. So. Whether or not the shooting on the aircraft happened or not, could it have happened? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and I know this because they maybe what I would like to put this in a later episode, but almost the same exact thing happened to my grandfather who flew in the okay. RAAF flying a short Sterling where they shot down three uh, BF 109s nice. doing this kind of maneuvering mm -hmm. um, to be able to save themselves. Anyway, so right. I'd like to table that one. So for those, yeah, who's yeah, like, you and I have talked about. No. We'll, we'll probably yeah. come back and do something special dedicated just to that. But to the naysayers who were like, "Ah, oh, this is this is BS. That never would have happened." It absolutely could have happened, uh, and certainly mm -hmm. the maneuvering happened. Did it happen as depicted? Right. Who knows? Uh, right. Given the amount of realism, the maneuvers that the B seventeen was doing in the show, I. I have enough faith in the in the producers and the historians of it that that the B seventeen was certainly capable of the maneuvers that we saw there, and Rosie was certainly a capable enough pilot to be able to do those kinds of things. Right, and the other thing I think it demonstrated that again, maybe you know, title cards or, or something. The, the one little thing I keep having is, is give us some content. Roger, you please. want to on the title? I know T Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg, please. Uh, you know. One of the difficulties that a Luftwaffe pilot would face if he wasn't uh, an expertin, right? I yeah. believe was the term they used in the theater bomber, uh, the Boeings, right? Yeah. Coming up after these, they're used to these formations where everyone's sticking together in formation. So you get lined up and you make your run. Well, now you've got a maneuvering B-17. Yeah. And this is something that that is not really 
something the Luftwaffe fighter pilots are used to. And without going down too much of an armaments geek rabbit hole, the cannon you're going to use to shoot down a B-17 have a relatively low velocity to have that large shell be, you know, a 30 millimeter shell or maybe a 20 millimeter shell. So your ballistics are, are difficult, very difficult on a moving fighter. And as we said before, the, the Americans, um, technological advantage in things like gyroscopes led to our fighters gun sights being more capable so this this made it harder for them to be shot down and is in my estimation i'm going to to suspect this is why they eventually got left alone they were they were too tough a target to keep going after when the germans started thinking about fuel and other missions that's right so on and so forth exactly yeah so eventually we get home and you know the the staff is waiting and we've got crosby waiting and and we've got the air exec waiting who you know if you rem- remember he's in the same boat as crosby because he got bumped from his squadron ride he did and now he's he's stuck sitting in hobes sending these guys off as is the the bomb group commander that's just his role in life which has got to be horrible you know the great scenes in 12 o'clock high of the drawer full of letters and yeah and so on and yeah. so forth and I like the fact that, well, you know, and I, I think it did happen in reality, but I like the fact that they included some other group's bomber landing at their bomb field because any port in a storm, right? That's exactly right, yeah. I'm, I'm going to go down wherever I can, and he comes back to the tower and says, your group's gone. Like, they're gone. Yeah. Which I, I they've probably fully believed, I would guess, because the last they saw, these guys are being set upon by the Luftwaffe and... There's nothing there left because Rosie's gone all over the sky trying to save himself and his plane and his crew. Yeah. Uh, But then we do get Rosie comes in and sets down in a way that it's almost worse, right? That's right. It's the only one. Everybody's wondering what's happened. And then they realize, oh, my goodness. Yeah. This is the worst punishment that they've taken. Right. And, you know, they did show, they show these guys coming out of... The being carried out of the plane, the medics coming over, the the you know everyone sort of just converging on the plane, which is a very natural thing. We think it's the only one. Everyone wants to be there, but now you see the human toll, right? These guys have had to come home with their buddies, like we were talking about after hours. They're wounded. We see, um, and I didn't catch whose face it was, but he just drops to the ground and he's he's getting sick That's just right. from everything, the yeah. stress, the the realization. And so I, I liked that they showed that. Yeah, I did too. Yeah. And yeah. very gut wrenching, you know? Right. And then of course we get to the letter, which, which closes the episode. And I thought that was, there's the nail in my emotional coffin <laughs> as I'm watching this episode. And I've read a couple different things, but I'll let you tell us what Miller tells us. I'll, I'll say definitively as definitive as we're going to get about uh, the letter itself. If if you've seen the episode, you know the letter I'm talking about. That's right. Well, you know, Crosby and Bubbles were were very, very good friends and they were good buddies. And just to remind everybody, although this is a dramatization, it is a TV show, these are real people. You know, these people really existed. They lived and died and fought and went through these horrible experiences. And so, when he dies, you know, that's the real emotion of having to go there, pack up his buddies, not leave it to one of the, the normal uh, mm-hmm. ground crew who, who would kind of take care of that thing, but to do to have that personal touch and do it yourself. And although the letter isn't mentioned specifically by by Miller, it, it is certainly in the realm of the possible. But but Crosby, um, you know, that this weighed on him for the rest of his time, you know, and, and mm-hmm. still did. And. To, to lose a close friend like that was absolutely yeah. gut wrenching for him. Yeah, I've I've read as we said I haven't read the book, but I've read in an article that it's believed that Bubbles actually did write that letter uh, to Crosby's wife, yeah. but was not able to send it. But they don't know that um, that uh, Crosby ever actually read that letter. So, but I think sort of a nice emotional touch that let us let us feel that pain of 
you know, you know, because Crosby is a very sympathetic character in my mind, and he's very emblematic or representative of sort of the U.S. everyman, right? Like Buck and Bucky are these larger than life, are. you know, flamboyant scarf around their neck, flyboys, and then you got Crosby, who's this guy who's doesn't really want to be in a war, doesn't really want to be in the Air Force, doesn't really think he should even be a navigator when he's starting, but he's so representative of all these guys in the United States and in, in every country, right? Who are like, I'm going to go and I'm going to do my job and I'm going to do what I need to do. But this is, this is the cost. And it's just, it's just agonizing. It is. And then my hat's off the producer. I don't know if this was done on purpose or if it was just the actor's portrayal, but the minute he got off at the beginning of the episode, when Crosby gets off the truck, he looks different. He looks different yes. than he did in episode one. He looks worn, almost kind of like sunken cheek, almost, you know, dark under the eyes. You know, I my hat's off to them for that, to show that kind of physical toll as time goes on. Again, whether it was intentional or unintentional, at least, or maybe I was projecting that, but yeah. when he got off the truck, I thought, he looks yeah. different. You know, he looks different right now. No, I, I felt the same, and that's that's a nice segue to to closing thoughts mm -hmm. and and our end ratings. So, uh, I don't know. Do you, do you have closing thoughts beyond the ratings? I think we've talked think about we've talked everything about that pretty well. Ratings. So, uh, we'll go with my rating, and I'm glad you said that because you know my ratings have been sort of trending downwards for the first four episodes, and I always said that. I was hoping that this would be a production that was greater than the sum of its parts. And this episode has made me feel that that's going to be the case. So I gave this episode a very solid four and a half stars. Uh, and I am beginning to think that this, that, that Masters of the Air is going to be every bit as impactful as Band of Brothers but I think it's going to be a little more nuanced and it's going to be the kind of things that you just said, where you are going to have to really pay attention to the way a character looks to read the strain, to read the, uh, the longer term effects. And we know I love my title cards, right? That, that I think are missing, <laughs> but a lot of this, you know, you're not going to put in, pardon me, a title card. And unfortunately, we're at a point where we're not in the late 1990s, 2000, and you can cut away to the guys from Easy Company and Band of Brothers. You can't do that to hear what they're thinking. So very solid 4.5. They're hitting the nuance of little details in filmmaking, in my opinion, as a, as a not a filmmaker. They're hitting historical details as a historian, and they're hitting the interpersonal and inter the inner military working something we didn't talk about but in the in the debrief the interrogation when the crew starts snapping at the air exec yeah and the air exec is you could see the look at his face it's one of those nuanced things right yep for me you know i've been an exo you've been an exo <laughs> exo's the hard ass exo's the bad guy exo's the disciplinarian and i saw him go internally uh, i'm gonna let this go this is not the time to stand on etiquette and protocol That's right. this, this is not it and you see the co just turn and walk away yeah for a, a multitude of reasons so i solid 4.5 i'm really happy with where things are going great for mine i I was going to give it a 4.5, <laughs> but I my, I bumped mine down to a 4.2 only for a very okay. personal thing. The slow yeah. motion shot of the B-17 and the, and the yeah. Schmidt going by, I was like, yeah. I did not care for that personally. You didn't like did it. Not. Okay. <laughs> and I understood the reason yeah. why behind it mm -hmm. and the kind of the artistic choice, yeah. which I don't disagree with, but I thought... It just, it didn't do it for me. <laughs> it, did, it didn't hit right for you in that it moment. Hit right Fair enough. For me. Fair enough. They had cut that out. I thought the scene was going beautifully with mm -hmm. the flying and um, yeah. maybe because it, it cut away from the, the flying skill of Rosie. I, I don't know. Yeah. And, and I guess I can see that because we'd seen the slow motion montage of the debris field. We had. 
sweet so right. red so and I'm, again as a yeah as an audience member i thought okay i get it i understand why they're doing this um or maybe my interpretation of it but that slow-mo part i, I just thought it was unnecessary <laughs> because yeah. up until now it, they've really highlighted just how quick brutal you know the air war has been and this i don't know i, I just didn't like yeah. it. so four point so <laughs> four point two so i'm not going to recant what i said i'm going to stick with my four point yeah. five but i will i will keep an open mind moving forward because i was looking at it going I wonder if they're just going to try and point out that the guys shooting at them are human too. Yeah. So if they expand upon that, I'll feel vindicated. But if they don't, I may have to come back later and go, ah, boy, I was right. I don't know. But as always, our ratings don't really matter. They don't. Right? Because we, we need to get the most important rating of the show. That's right. So Zoe's rating was a 4.1. Okay. Uh, again, her least favorite parts of the show have been not the flying per se, but with the masks, you know, as they quickly cut from mm -hmm. person to person, unless you're really paying attention or a historical geek like us, then right. you can quickly delineate and you've, and you've grown up in that environment. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. hard, I think, for your, for your average audience member to, uh, to, to quickly make the association, you know, who's who in the zoo, especially they're mm -hmm. changing crew positions, you know, right. Buck, yeah. Bucky and, you know, everybody's all kind of all over the map. Um, so some of her least favorite parts were that, but during the battle scene, I mean, she had her pillow tight, and then yeah. when the when the bombardier, after they shoot the Norm bomb sight, he gets hung up on the door, and he's kind of yeah. hanging there. Both of us were like, "Oh my yeah. god!" Like, ah, what's yeah. gonna happen? I thought that yeah. guy was gonna go into a prop, or something. oh yeah, and I, I was like, I, "Just I, like, oh, the oh, oh, Lord!" Yeah. Both of us were just out of our mind, but. Which she, I mean, she didn't enjoy it, but you could really see at the end of the episode, even though you see it in the air, like, we're the only one left. When they come back and land, mm -hmm. and they're only one interrogation, she was like, wait, none of them made it back? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, none of them made it back. They're the only crew yeah. that made it. And in other episodes, we've seen a full interrogation room, and it's just packed full of right. crews and people smoking and drinking coffee and whatnot. And now it, it's it's eerily quiet. And um, yeah, in there right now, but she really felt the emotional impact uh, of that. Of that, still liked it, still enjoying it, still very, still excited right. to watch the next episode. Right. So again, note to Mr. Spielberg, Spielberg and Mr. Hanks, uh, maybe not not historically accurate. Maybe names on the cockpit canopy rails, or you know, <laughs> outside or something. Right. Give us a little. Uh, Give us a little help, uh, you know, just so because I get that. But all right, awesome. But good to hear she's still enjoying oh, it, yeah. and it's it's conveying what they want it to convey. Because yeah. at the end of the day, right? I yeah, I think this is more important than just your average entertainment show. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I'll give an example of something totally unrelated. No, I'm not being paid. No, this is not a, you know, not shilling for anything else. But like, you know, the remake of Shogun, or I should say the reimagining or, yes. or the new Shogun series is coming up. I remember watching that as a kid. I've, I've read the book and I'm excited to see that. But that is so long in the past and is completely fictional or at least based on, on fact, but not a true story. I'm going to compare and contrast. This is more important. Right. This this is our history. And I think it's important to do more than just the numbers in a history book of this many bombers and this many crews. And this is what happened. And Hitler was defeated. It was this gut wrenching sacrifice on the part of 19, 20, 20, 23, 24 year old Americans. That's right. That's right. And, and Brits. And I guess, to be fair, we have to say Germans, you know, I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, that gets dicey, but I'll just say, you know, not every German was a Nazi and, and a lot of them answered the call to their country and a lot of Russians and, a, you know, the Japanese are a different case because they didn't have a choice, but they still went, you know, so. Yeah, but I just think it shows the brutality of war across Absolutely. all aspects of it, you know, where, where, you know, in modern warfare, everyone is affected. That's right. Absolutely. So. I think that is the note to end on. I am excited to see what we get in the next episode. It feels like an, uh, another transition episode. 
or, or bridge episode from the previews, but we'll see. That's right. We shall see. All right. Boyle, thank you as always. Loved it. And we'll talk to everyone next week. Thanks, Roger. See ya.